Next on BYUSN, let's take a deep dive into last year's football metrics and discuss just how much of a leap we expect BYU football's offense and defense to take in year two of the Big 12. Plus, a tradition unlike any other starts today, which begs the question, which sport sporting or which four sporting events rather make up your Mount Rushmore of attending sporting events? And former BYU running back Brian McDonald will break down where he expects BYU's offense to improve and what he saw from LJ Martin last season. And Hunter Ava of BYU softball breaks down BYU's affinity for grand slams and previews the matchup with the defending national champs. Hunter is the queen of diamonds. Welcome to BYU Sports Nation, presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. It is Thursday, April 11th. It is the opening day of the Masters in Augusta. More on that in a moment. I'm Spencer Linton. He is an aspiring college football game cover model, Austin Colley. I don't think I made the cut. <laughs> Last time I was on the show, we talked about the NCAA yes. video game. Yes. How excited I was, how excited you were. Such a such a huge part of our, our uh, you know, upbringing, right? Uh, we're seeing banners being placed all over campuses yeah. as some marketing ploy, which I think is absolutely genius. Yes. But to start us off, Spence, if BYU yes. had a cover, who would be on that cover for you? This is really difficult. Like, if you have to go with somebody that is currently on the team, like right now, and we saw this a few months ago, we saw Darius Lassiter's one-handed catch behind his head, a yep. la Odell Beckham against Texas Tech. Like, that image was awesome. So if it had to be somebody on the team right now doing something that was accomplished recently, I would have to go with that. But all time, I feel like you have to go with the Heisman Trophy winner, Austin. Like, if you did the legend. The, okay. Yeah, you did the legend version of college football. He was the king of college football in 1990. So I, I would probably lean towards Ty Detmer on that legendary cover, but it's hard to go wrong with McMahon or Young. I mean, it's crazy. I dig that. You ready for mine? Yeah, let's go. Taysom Hill. Oh, Taysom Hill. Maybe the hurdle over Texas, oh. right? Yes. But yes. I, I, I got to yes. be honest with you, I, I don't think there's a football player that has played in Lavelle Edwards Stadium that has been a better overall football player, like the epitome of college football. When I think college yes. football, I think Taysom Hill. He literally, in the NFL no less, is the first man since Frank Gifford to throw 10 touchdown passes, catch 10, 10 touchdown passes, and run in for 10 touchdowns. He's been unbelievable. And I think that, you know, that, that also emerges the two kind of – I mean, he's, he's a little older, you yeah. know. Yeah. He's not current, right? Okay. But, uh, you know, it's not so old that, you know, that, that uh, <laughs> we're not getting any, you know, outdated photos, right? New imaging, right? I think it would be a cleaner look. But, yeah, Taysom Hill, for me, the epitome of college football and definitely could see him on the cover. For what it's worth, college football 09, if it were a BYU edition, I wouldn't mind your one-handed catch against Colorado State as well. I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> I, I need know. you. I need you. Later I'm going to ask you, I need you to think about the moment, the best, like, the image that, that – you enjoyed the most from when you played at BYU on your teams. Okay, maybe you know already, but I'll, I'll add, like we'll okay. tease we'll tease the audience. Let, let me noodle on that. I one. will I will ask you later, and we'll answer that question. For the moment, all rise and shout. Football is on the mind. It's time for what's trending. We chose the dramatic music for good reason. BYU football, you may have heard, lost five straight games to close out the 2024 season. Austin, BYU hasn't won a game in football since October. And we're going to take a deep dive into the numeric struggles that show why BYU football could not climb over the hill in November. Specifically, uh, beginning with the offense, okay? So just... Take, take into consideration some of these numbers, and don't fear not, we're going to discuss what we expect to be better. But in total offense, this is unbelievable. This is BYU we're talking about. Austin, you, you put on some all-time offenses, okay? Last year, BYU was 118th overall in FBS. That's like bottom 10th, okay? In total offense with 309.8 yards a game. Scoring offense, only 23 a game. This is BYU's offense. They're used to scoring 24 points in a quarter. 
Yeah, it hasn't, uh, you know, has, hasn't been of BYU historic teams or historic production. But, you know, I, I got to be honest with you. I, I think the trajectory that we were headed on towards the end of the season, even though the record didn't show, I, I think things were gelling. I think I think A Rod didn't anticipate a lot of things, right? I, I, I think you know our offense heavily relied on the play action. Uh, we we weren't getting that because we couldn't establish a run game. We Amen. had a freshman running back, as we're seeing here with LJ, who maybe a little bit inexperienced, maybe had a little bit of hesitation. But man, is he as raw as ever? And I expect a huge year from uh, okay. for him. Okay. But. Uh, yeah, you know, new conference. I think there was just some kind of, you know, some growing pains we had to go through. I really, really like the trajectory uh, of what we what we finished the season on last year and kind of what's going on, you know, this year. BYU losing five straight, yes. And Jake Retzloff, I mean, he had to face all top five Big 12 teams and Oklahoma and Oklahoma State and Iowa State and West Virginia. Not yeah, easy you, sledding you gotta, for you the gotta, back you of look, Yeah, you got to look at the schedule, too, of who we were playing, man. We were playing some very difficult teams with great defenses. Rough. Uh, as well as great ground game, right? So, I mean, it was, uh, you know, the red zone offense has got to get better. Our, our first and second down efficiency has got to okay. get better, which we're not seeing here. Okay. Um, uh, but, yeah, we do those things, man. And I think, I, honestly, I think this team, especially the offensive side of the ball, is going to be gelling a lot better. We're going to throw out some more numbers here. BYU averaged 1.6 points per drive, which was 111th in FBS. Okay, so 118th overall total offense in the football bowl subdivision, 99th in points per game, and 111th in points per drive. Okay, these are all almost historically bad numbers for BYU, really as bad as they've been since 2017 when BYU last had a losing record, 4-9, and nine, only this time it's in the Big 12, okay? The defense, statistically speaking, not that much better, Austin. Total defense, BYU gave up almost 418 yards a game. That's 106th in the bowl subdivision. Scoring defense, Cougars allowed almost 30 points a game. That's 96th. Points per drive was middle of the pack-ish, but still bottom half. 2.29 points per drive, giving up 74th in FBS. The best statistic out of all six of those numbers that I gave you on offense and defense is the defense giving up 2.3 points per drive, which was not even top half in college football. This is, this is crazy. And I know that the competition took a massive uptick moving into the Power Five level. Ten Power Fives for the first time ever. So... I, I'm considering that as well. But we'd still expect the BYU to win six games and still be average middle of the pack in these numbers. So when you look at these numbers, Austin, yep. I know you said you expect the BYU offense and defense to take some leaps. My question for you is how big of a leap do you expect both sides of the ball to take and why do you expect that? Okay, so uh, it's a great question. Okay, I, I think – in terms of biggest leap that we're going to see this year, I, I'm going to have to go with the defense. Okay. 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 All right. And here's why. One, this will be the second year under Jay Hill's regime. Yes. And his defense. Mm -hmm. There's something to be said about having to learn a new system, right? There's growing pains, like I said before, to have to go through that. This is going to be the second year under that system. Yep. Okay. A lot of guys more comfortable with it. And he brings in a linebacker who is at the heart of his defense, who knows it, who played it, and played it well at Weber State. Okay. We also have the return of Tyler Batty. Animal, right? He's got a little screw loose, which you have to have playing <laughs> defensive end. Okay? I like Tyler a lot. We got the return of Ben Bywater. That yeah. was a huge loss last year, right? Kind of the bell cow of the defense. Made that defense go. Has a little – brought that swagger that he has to the defense. That was a huge missing piece. And then also Jacob Robinson. One thing that we have to also account for is – we were playing with, and this is what I would want to know, of the total defensive yards allowed, yeah. how many of those were passing yards? Because our secondary, I mean, we were, we were at the bottom of the barrel in terms of roster. Yes, BYU right? was playing their fifth and sixth safeties. Fifth and sixth right. at times. Because if I remember right, I think against the run game, we faced some of the top running backs in the country, right? Without question. Without question. And we did a pretty dang good job against them. Right. I mean, uh, and so to me, if, if I if I'm if I'm remembering right, we, we couldn't handle the air raid or we couldn't handle the, the ball in the air really well. And that just goes to inexperience and who we had back there. But with Jacob Robinson leading the pack and getting those returning starters back, uh, you know, I, I do think 
the defense is poised to make a greater jump. Okay, and you bring up some big names. I'm going to throw Micah Harper back into the mix, too. Okay. He's gone through two season-ending injuries in different seasons, but Micah playing safety and Jay Hill coaching the safeties, along with the understandable depth that has been developed. So as much as it stunk last year yeah. to play a bunch of guys at safety and have to move the secondary around, all of those guys got incredibly important and relevant reps. Right. So Jay Hill's got some options to work with, some guys – that made plays that were not expected to make plays. Uh, Ethan Slade comes to mind. I mean, Ethan was maybe fourth on the depth chart yeah. when the season began. Yeah. All of a sudden, halfway through the year, he's your best safety on the field. He's making plays. Right. So that should help. I've long stood by the idea that the core, when the core comes back and has experienced tough times together, typically, Austin, there's something to be said about that. Just... And I know basketball is a different sport, but no. look at what BYU basketball did. Yeah, you know, you're 100%, right? Like, you got your core guys, man. That, that like I said, like a, like a Ben Bywater and a Jacob Robinson and a Tyler Batty and... Jack Kelly is the, the linebacker, by the way, that Jay Hill brings over from Weber State. And a bunch of his teammates are saying, dude, he's, he's maybe the best defender on the team right now. Okay. But you have a core group of guys, man. That swagger and that mentality and that attitude oozes out on everybody else, okay. right? And everybody latches on and goes along for the ride, right? Which is why, you know, those losses are huge, especially on the defensive side of the ball, because that, that cohesion uh, it plays such a huge part in a defensive success. Now, I'm not saying that the offense isn't poised for a great year. Sure, technically speaking, they were so bad last year, there's more room to hit to, to move up, right? L- listen, I, I, I think I, this is a hard decision for me because I look at the offense as well. The QB position is in question, and that is going to be that is going to play a huge part in the success of the offense. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. By yes, the way, yes, absolutely. But I look at guys like that are that are developing into leadership roles again that are going to be that core and yeah. are going to have an effect on everybody else. Like like Chase Roberts, Keanu Hill in a new position. I think him being in tight end. We had him on the show not too long ago, but him being at tight end allows him to kind of like spread his wings a little bit and take a little bit more ownership in the team where he's not just one of six receivers, okay? Um, I think guys like, uh, uh, you know, Jake Rotzla- uh, Retzloff, I know, you know, the, like we said, the QB's in question, but I do think he brings a certain swagger to him, and he was kind of thrown into the fire last year. Sure. Not expecting to play. Uh, had to go against, like we said, some of the top programs in the conference, um, and I thought he did, you know, fairly well given the circumstances. So, you know, I can expect him coming in, you know, uh, if he is the guy to have, you know, uh, a, a lot more confidence, a lot more swagger than he did last year. Okay, we'll finish out with this thought, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or if you disagree here, but offensively speaking, if the offensive line is better, and we keep hearing like. It's going to be way better than it was last year. And it was not good last year. It wasn't because they didn't have talent. Yeah, it's not going to be hard to be Changing better. schemes and moving pieces. So many different starting lineups up front. Yeah. It, just, it just didn't work last year. But I keep hearing that's going to be the most improved position group on offense. If the offensive line is dramatically improved, Austin, then – how much of a difference with them? Is that enough to be like, okay, you go from 118th in total offense because now you can establish a run game behind offense line, and now you're middle of the pack. Maybe you're 65. Yeah, 100%. Okay, is it that simple? Yeah. The offensive line I, is I, good and is better. I, I, I think you're spot on. All right. On the, on, on the nose, bro. <laughs> All right, offensive line it is. Okay, Austin, on to topic two. And okay. this is such a fun discussion. Such, I, I, I've been waiting for this topic, okay? Appropriately wearing the shirt. But given the spirit of the Masters starting today, yep. which four sporting events are on your Mount Rushmore of sporting events, Spencer? Well, the Masters was definitely one of them. It was, it was on the bucket list. So once I, I had the amazing opportunity, shout out to my buddy, Corey Oshimura, who works for the PGA Tour. He's based in Tokyo. Uh, he is essentially one of Hideki Matsuyama's handlers who won okay. the Masters a few years ago. Anyway, Corey so kind to take me and so i got to check that off the bucket list um how, how much did you end up spending at the uh, pro shop there <laughs> did you go did you did you go in oh baby two two handfuls like austin we're talking like uh i think i think i pushed 1300 bucks i think that would be the i mean other than watching yeah watching the golf's great but the pro shop and the, the swag shopping was incredible notice how you, i don't the have shop, a shirt the shopping was incredible for sure once I checked that off the bucket list, I opened up a space on my Mount Rushmore. Um, and so I had a lot of fun thinking about, okay, what 
what would I put on this list? And it begins with the World Cup final. Oh, how I wish I could have been at la the last World Cup final when Lionel Messi and Argentina just pulled out an unbelievable performance to win right there. The FIFA World Cup final uh, is leading the way for me. And then I would love to go to the Olympics and track and field, specifically the sprint finals. I want to watch the 4x100 live at the Olympics and the 100 meter okay. and the 200 meter, like to see the fastest men and women in the world. Okay. Like I want to watch that at the Olympics. I thought it's such an exciting event for me, and the yep. Olympics is such a grand stage. Uh, the last two would be the World Series, specifically if my favorite team, the Baltimore Orioles, are playing in the World Series for the first time since 1983. It's been a very long time since they have played in the Fall Classic. If the Orioles get to the World Series, I will find a way to be there and check that one out the bucket list. And then lastly, another golf event, the Open Championship. Maybe it's in Scotland or Ireland, but watching the best of golf play in Europe on those historic tracks where golf was essentially invented in Scotland, that to me would be two, two, bucket list. Two golf events on the Mount Rushmore? There were. There were until the Masters got checked off. Now it's the Open okay. Championship. That's the one that slid in. Okay. Like now that the Masters, I was like, okay, we'll, we'll leave one golf event on the mountain, and that is the Open Championship. What about you? College football playoff. Okay. BYU uh, playing B there or just the college uh, football playoff in college general? College football playoff. Okay. Always get hyped for that. Okay. March Madness. Like the final, final four, or just, just the just tournament in general? The entire three weeks, dude, okay. is freaking just nonstop fun. Okay. Filling out the brackets with the fam. 100%. Putting money on it. My son's won it twice, two years in a row now. Okay. I don't know how. Okay. Guy doesn't watch a bit of a lick of college basketball, but somehow picks the winners. Okay. <laughs> that goes typically. Yeah. Okay. The Masters have not been. Would love to go. Would love to get some swag. Okay. And then I, too, World Cup. Oh, man. Served my mission in uh, Argentina. Bro. In Buenos Aires. Okay. Messi, literally a god down there. Okay. <laughs> I was down there for World Cup 2006, yeah. I believe it was. Yes. Okay. Yes. America made it to the, the what, the 16? And uh, things got wild. <laughs> My appreciation for soccer grew. I love Premier Soccer. Very, very much a bucket list uh, uh, event for me. So you, like me, I didn't... I thought I understood the importance of soccer on the world no, scale. You don't understand until you leave these, and these Exactly, borders. until you leave the borders. So I was in Korea when Korea was hosting the World Cup in 2002 yeah, on my mission. It was in Korea and Japan. Yeah. And to see a million people, a million Korean people, a picture in the Seoul Square yeah. of them all watching the game on big screens in yeah. downtown Seoul, a million people. Yeah. It was like, oh my gosh. This is, it literally is like warfare in the form of an athletic event like yeah. on the world scale. And to watch them go to the round, to the semifinals, Korea. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Like, at that point, I was like, I'm all in. Yeah, double that. I'm double that. In. Double that. And that's, that's what Argentina is. Okay? Yeah. <laughs> Korea's got nothing on Argentina, bro. <laughs> Argentina, reigning FIFA World Cup champs. Right. No, no argument there. Our question of the day. And we want you to answer the same question we just did. In the spirit of the Masters beginning today, which four sporting events are on your Mount Rushmore of sporting events? J.D. McKell on X answers, the World Cup, he's with us. The Olympics, I feel you. March Madness and the Super Bowl. Austin, you played in a Super Bowl. Did yeah. you have time to, like, really, I, I get, marinate in the grandeur of that event? Yeah, or was yeah. it all, it was so business, it's just you couldn't get into that? Yeah, yeah yes and no. Like, now, I, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's a reason why I left it off my list, okay? I watch it every year. It brings me pain. Yeah, yeah. It takes me for like a week every year. <laughs> and it gets worse and worse and worse, right? Because <laughs> now you realize the, 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 the impact and, and just how big of, of a deal it is. Yeah. And the fact that I went, I was there, could have won, didn't. And on such a stupid onside kick flub, right? Like we were killing them. Anyways, I can't. I watch Super Bowl, Super Bowl every year, dude. Tanks me for like a week. <laughs> it's off my Mount Rushmore. <laughs> I love how real you are about oh, it, though. It's, it kills me. That's, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, you, you play, but you played in it. Yeah. You played in it, dude. There, there's something in that. There's something. There's hey. That's, yeah, we got to move past this one. <laughs> we, need to, we need to move on. Hashtag BYUSN on X, Facebook, and Instagram.
All right, so BYU baseball hosts Baylor tonight in the first game of a three-game series at Miller Park. First pitch is at 8 Eastern, and you can watch on Big 12 Now on ESPN Plus or listen on BYU Radio. After the break, former BYU running back standout Brian McDonald returns to the program to discuss BYU's backs this year and where he thinks BYU's offense will improve the most. This is BYUSN. We are live at Studio B. This is your day-to-day -day BYU Sports play-by-play. -play. I am Spencer Linton alongside Austin Colley. Joining us now to discuss the BYU football offense, specifically the running backs, is former running back standout Brian McDonald on the show. Brian, welcome back to BYUSN. Hey, thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it. It's never fun to discuss numbers, especially when they don't bode well or look uh, shine brightly upon what a program is or what a program did. But we kind of had to do that last segment to discuss where BYU football is, offensively speaking, going into year two of the Big 12. And it's 118th in total offense, Brian. Um, the, the run game never really got going. BYU didn't score a ton of points, so let's just start with this all-encompassing question. How in the world do you fix it, my friend? Where does it begin for BYU next year? Uh, it begins up front with the line. Uh, the line needs to play better. You have the backs to be able to, to run the ball. LJ is a special kid. Um, I remember I was there at a few practices last year, um, and they were doing their running back drills. Uh, most of the running backs were going about maybe five yards after um, where the drill was supposed to end, but LJ was taking it 20, 30 yards down um, and was really kind of setting the example even before he was even named the starter. So he's special. Um, hopefully Miles will be able to, to show those flashes that he does in practice actually in the games. Um, and then with Hinkley back, I think they have a pretty, pretty good solid backfield. But if the line can't, if the line can't, you know, open up holes for them, it's all going to be for naught. Right. Real quick, t touching on LJ, right? Because I, I agree with you. The kid's a special kid, right? As a, as a true freshman coming in, uh, only you know six months prior, running against high, you know, run around on high school defenses. What what do you think is his biggest strength, and what do you think is the the main thing that he needs to improve this next year to really take that next uh, that, that next jump? Yeah, I think he just needs to be a little bit more, a little bit more patient in regards to letting the the play develop. I saw some of that in um, in spring this year and towards the end of the end of the year last year. Um, so just really working on his on his patience. I'm excited to see him in the system in year two because I think Aaron's going to do a great job in regards to getting him the ball, um, not just handing it off, but out of the backfield and and really using him um, just like they did Jamal. Um, you know, he was able to put on more weight, um, but still be able to maintain his speed and probably got a little bit faster. So it's going to be exciting to see him in, in year two. But once again, if if the line can't, um, you know, can't hold up and can't open up holes, then it's going to be we're going to be in for the same same thing we saw saw last year. They just need that. They just need to play with more of an edge on the line. They need, like, uh, back when I played, we had a uh, Jason Sukanik and mm. and Teague Whiting who had that edge and nastiness. I think that is needed for a great offensive line. Talk, talk, talk to me about the psyche real quick of a running back. When when you got an offensive line that may be a little iffy or questionable, what does that do to your psyche as a running back? Oh, you're just rushing. You're just trying to get um, any any hole. You're not being patient. You're just rushing and not letting the play develop because you don't have confidence in your line. Um, and so, hopefully, as they're you know the lines another year in the, into the system and being a little bit more cohesive, playing together, um, that that confidence LJ will be able to to grow and to have with the offensive line. Brian McDonald is with us on BYU Sports Nation. You played with a true dual threat quarterback in Brandon Doman, and now BYU has either Jake Retzloff or Gary Bohannon. There is very much a quarterback battle brewing at BYU, but whoever is the starter and whoever's playing, and I expect both will probably play meaningful snaps this season. That's the way college football is now. But how much of a difference will that make for BYU's offense, knowing that you're preparing for and going into the season with a dual threat quarterback instead of a pocket passer like Keaton Slovis was? Oh, you have to, I mean, in, especially in Aaron's offense, you have to respect the run of the quarterback. 
I mean, I think when Keaton was in there, um, hadn't had any rushing touchdowns, and then he starts, you know, breaking off these long runs at, at BYU. And so in this offense, you have to have a, a dual threat quarterback. The quarterback has to play a role in the run game. Um, and as the defense is, is not just keen on the, on the running backs that they have to respect the quarterback, it just it opens up the field and opens up the holes even more. Brian, I, I want to add this, and you bring up the offensive line. T.J. Woods takes over as the offensive line coach for the Cougars. And anytime there's a regime change, like people like a change of pace. You know, it's kind of like you've been eating the same type of M&Ms for a long time, and then a new flavor comes in. You're like, oh, I like these caramel <laughs> M&Ms. These are, these are really good, you know? like Great just analogy. Just variety, right? Yeah. But how much of a difference can an offensive line coach really make in one year other than just being a change of pace and a different flavor? Um, it, he can make a major change. Sometimes it's just a different voice. Um, I mean, Austin May probably sees that with, with his kids. He can be telling his kids, you know, how to execute a, a particular play um, and not necessarily listening to him, but another coach comes in and says the exact same thing that, that Austin just, you know, just told them. And then all of a sudden the light bulb comes on. And so you're like sitting there thinking like, I just told you that exact same thing. And so I think, you know, Coach Woods can have a major impact on the um, on the offensive line. I mean, he has a proven track record um, wherever he's gone in regards to building a strong, a strong competitive and, and nasty offensive line unit. Yeah, I think I, I think you're you're 100 uh, percent spot on, Brian. Right. Like I think with coaches, what makes a great coach, I think every coach has has, you know, the, the level of knowledge when you've been in the game for quite some time you know, th there's not much disparity, but the way that it is conveyed and taught is really where, you know, the, 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 the proof of the, in the pudding is for a, or how good a coach is, right? Uh, what, what type of level uh, a coach is, is able to coach at, right? So m moving on to conference talk, right? We're in the big, uh, big 12 la uh, uh, now. Last year was our first year. We saw a lot of great competition. We got a couple players moving out. We got a a handful of players moving into the conference, one of them being Utah, okay? Are you glad to see Utah-BYU rivalry back in play? Oh, yeah. I mean, who's who's not excited for um, to be able to – a BYU fan to be able to play Utah again and, um, and have that rivalry um, kind of re reignite? Um, the only person that I can think of is, is maybe my buddy Corey Hickman, who lives out in Montana. <laughs> His wife's a, a Utah fan, and he's a diehard BYU fan. And so, you know, that week leading up to the game is is, is a house divided. Um, and so he <laughs> may be the only one that might not be too happy about, about Utah coming back into the conference. Brian McDonald is with us on BYU Sports Nation. Now, you have an interesting perspective uh, in your years at BYU. You kind of saw what BYU did in 2000. Lavelle's last miracle was 6-6. Six and six And, you know, no bowl game for six wins back then. I kind of wish that would be the case now, but there are so many bowl games. <laughs> Conversation for another day. But then in 01, BYU takes a leap. New head coach, but that same core came back, and you and Brandon Doman were very much at the heart of that. Brian, so what was the difference for BYU football going from 2000 to 2001 and taking that leap that all BYU fans are kind of hoping the Cougars will do this year? Yeah, I think the, the leap was really a, a change, in, change in voice. Um, and then also um, putting the ball in your playmaker's hands. And I, and I feel like that's definitely one thing that, that A-Rod does well, that he gets the ball in his, in his playmaker's hands. And so I expect to see the ball in LJ's hands a lot, Cody's hands, Chase Roberts, um, that, you know, he's going to be able to, you know, to, to do his part in regards to having that explosive offense again. Um, and I'm confident that the offensive line will, um, will play better. Um, there's, I mean, there's only one what they can only go up from, where we were at last year. And so um, I think we'll be in for a good year and hopefully be able to, to make a bowl game because, um, you know, not going to not going to a bowl game is it's not fun and makes for definitely a long off season. OK, so I'm going to put you on the spot, then. What are your expectations, realistic expectations for the Ooh. BYU football program next year? Bowl game. Um, 
yeah, bowl game is is really kind of my my expectation for us uh, for us next year. I mean, it's a tough schedule. You, I mean, second game in, you're playing SMU, who's um, is a high powered offense, um, has you know done some great things in, in transfer portal, and yeah. and definitely has the money in the NIL to be able to get some players. And so, like, we're not going to have a, a cakewalk schedule. Um, we're going to have to, you know. We're going to be in every game. Our defense, um, I love what they're doing on the defensive side of the ball. They're very intentional in regards to the people that they're bringing into the program um, that know the system, that are a good fit. And so I'm excited for that, um, for the defense to really, um, really lead out um, the team this year. Um, it's definitely going to be on that defensive side of the ball. Let's go. Brian, it's always great to catch up with you. Uh, always an inspiration when you come on the show. We appreciate your example, everything you mean to BYU, and how you continue to rep the Y. Thanks for the time, man. No problem. Thanks, you guys. And Jaron better watch out. I think Austin might be coming for, <laughs> for his spot. We have put Jaron on notice, and we're doing it again right you, now, bro. Brian. I'm telling you. Right. That is right. Keep Take it up, man. <laughs> Checks in the mail, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, brother. It's always great. Yeah. Always great to have. Yes. Fellow alumni on, yes. especially football alumni, give their insight. His conversion story is incredible, too. I know. I like, wish we could have got to that. Yeah, it's okay. Hey, it's we, right. we've done it before. You can find it in the archives. Brian is a fantastic representative of what BYU football is all about. No question. All right, BYU Sports Nation will be live for the BYU Fan Fest in Dallas on Saturday, Go. April 27th, for one hour special starting at 12 Eastern on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Come hang out in Dallas. Let's go. Up next, where BYU's draft guys currently reside on Mel Kuyper's latest big board. Plus, oh man, this is a tough one for BYU women's volleyball. A star is headed out, hanging it up in her career. This is BYU Sports Nation. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store, official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Follow BYU Sports Nation on social media for content throughout the day on Facebook, X, Instagram, YouTube, and TikTok. Welcome back to Studio B. I am Spencer. He is Austin. So much has been said about Dennis taking over for Jerem. Brian McDonald just gave his push for you to take over for Jerem. I mean, why wouldn't he? A Collie takeover? I mean, why wouldn't he? <laughs> Maybe Jerem's going to start saying no time for Austin Collie at the end of the program. <laughs> Let's get to today's headlines. No Kuiper. The genius that he is released his updated NFL draft position rankings just two weeks out from the NFL draft. Super excited for it. Yep. Kuiper has BYU's Kingsley Suamata. How, how do you say that? Suamataia. Suamataia as the ninth best offensive tackle. Keen Slovis as the ninth best quarterback. And Ryan okay. Rico as the third best punter. He also had uh, Kingsley going to the Kansas City Chiefs in the second round in his latest mock draft. All right. Ooh, Kingsley and Andy Reid potential reunion there in the NFL for BYU. BYU baseball begins a three-game series with Baylor today at Miller Park. The Batcats have won three of the last four, including a series win at Texas and a decisive win at Utah. First pitch tonight, 8 Eastern, Big 12 now on ESPN+, Plus. also live on BYU Radio. And BYU softball is on the road for a three-game series at number two Oklahoma, Sheesh. the powerhouse. The Sooners had won 40 straight Big 12 games before losing to Texas last weekend. BYU is still looking for their first Big 12 road win of the season. Can it be against Oklahoma? Mm. The first pitch is tonight at 7 Eastern on ESPN+. BYU Volleyball's Erin Livingston announcing yesterday on her social media accounts that she is retiring from college volleyball. This is significant because Livingston is the best player on Heather Olmstead's roster right now. Livingston totaled almost 1,300 kills in her career and was named an ABCA All-American twice while she played for BYU. Good luck to Aaron as she moves on. Wow. Former BYU golfer and 2003 Master Champion Mike Weir tees off at 2 Eastern in the Masters Tournament today. Good luck, Mr. Weir. Go get him. Get him straight. Yes, BYU men's and women's track and field beginning their competition in California at the Brian Clay Pacific Coast and Beach Invitationals this weekend. The women's team currently ranked number nine in the country, and the men's team ranked number 19. BYU's a running school, Austin. <laughs> at number 44, BYU Women's Tennis begins their final homestand of the season today when they host Cincinnati in a Big 12 match. Those are today's headlines. Now some opinions in the whip. The Cougar Whip Round presented by Maris, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Okay, so we just talked about Erin yep. Livingston, and now she's moving on. Greener pastures, yep. 
Retiring from the collegiate volleyball scene, how big of a loss is this to BYU? This would be like losing your starting quarterback uh, on your football team. BYU doesn't have it's a starting hit. quarterback per se, but like, let's go back a few years. This would be like Jaron Hall just being like, hey, I'm leaving early for the draft. Good luck. Do we like, know why? Uh, she just felt like she's just, just had hit the, the the end of her road. Lost the fire. Yeah, I, I mean, I, we, don't, we don't we don't know specific reasons, but apparently she just was like, you know what, the grind on the body and all that. It's just she's just done. She's ready to move on in, in her life. Okay. But th this would be like losing Jaron Hall at quarterback if he just was like, nah, I'm out. I'm good. Like you guys figure it out. That that's the significance of something yeah, like that. Yeah, that would this. be felt. Yeah. Oh my gosh, for sure. Okay, Mel Kuyper has Kingsley Suomataia projected to go to the Kansas City Chiefs, as we just mentioned. Last pick in the second round. We heard Kingsley was projected as high as number 22 in the first round. So there's some movement there. But would a matchup or a fit with the Chiefs be the perfect fit for Kingsley? I, I mean, I don't know. Obviously, we love to play the whole BYU tie, Andy Reid, right? There's, we got some BYU players on the Chiefs right now. I, I you know, I, I think it could be a, a great landing spot for him. The other team, Baltimore Ravens, right? Ooh. In a massive need, especially Ooh. at the interior line yes. position. I can yes. see him going there. There's a BYU tie there with KVN as well. Exactly. Let's go. Let's go. Okay. Okay. So, Mel Kuyper, yeah. he's got Keaton Slovis at the ninth best QB in the draft class. What kind of shot do you give Keaton to get drafted? If you're the ninth best quarterback in this specific draft, I, I, that feels like free agent contract to me. Like I, I, so not a super high percentage that Keaton will get drafted. And even if he did get drafted, Austin, it would be late. And in my opinion, if you're gonna go in the sixth or seventh round, you may as well just like be an undrafted free agent and have your pick That's with your agent yeah. of where you want to go and where you feel like you fit, your skill set fits the best. Like, Bunch of teams will start calling, so you'll have multiple options. So I, I'd give him like a 10% chance to get drafted, and maybe that's too high. I think he's going to be an undrafted free agent. Okay. All right. What, you, you disagree? Sixth round. Sixth round. You think sixth round? I think sixth round. Draft picks matter. That would be great for him. In the spirit of the reports of an NHL team getting closer to coming to Utah, which sport would you like to see added to BYU's repertoire? I, I, I'm a huge soccer fan. Okay. Men's soccer? Love, I would love to see men's soccer. I'd also like to see rugby, right? Rugby to have, like, with how dominant they were essentially without scholarships for so long. Right. Like, it would be cool to see rugby be a sanctioned sport. And now, now they're competing with Cal for, like, NCAA That's national champions. Like, let's, we already have a built-in champion. Let's yeah. bring it on in to the fold. Well, I've long wanted men's soccer, though. That's my number one. Like, I, I feel like they're ready to, to take on something bigger. Yeah. For sure. Absolutely. Okay, so softball begins a three-game series at Powerhouse Oklahoma today. Mm. Huge game. Mm. Would a win against the Sooners be the best win for BYU team this year? Yes. Yes. What about ever? <laughs> We're talking about a juggernaut in the softball community. Yeah, okay? Has there ever been, has there ever been a, a better a better team? No, in they, college they are softball. The, seriously, no, they they are the queens of the sport. Right. Right? They just dominate. Right. So to win, and, and it's in Norman too. So as, as fun as it was to watch BYU men's basketball win in Lawrence against Kansas, like that, that really wouldn't hold a candle to beating the this defending would, this national champions. This would be like champions. beating Bama. This would be like beating yes. Bama in football. Yes, Okay. 100%, that's how good they are. So beating number two in Norman, that would easily be the best win by any BYU team in year one of the Big 12 campaign. No question. Check out the latest Her Why podcast featuring Arielle Mackey Williams of BYU Women's Basketball. She talks about her conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, leaning on her faith to overcome her ACL injury and her relationship with her teammates. Check it out wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, let's keep going with this softball conversation in Norman and the series with the defending national champs and do so by welcoming Hunter Abba to the program after the break. Hunter, going to talk about how BYU can pull off a stunner tonight. This is BYU Sports Nation. This portion of BYU Sports Nation is presented by Maersk, your e-commerce logistics shipping partner. Pitchers certainly know to pitch carefully when Ava is in the batter's box. Yes. Walk on! Home run for Hunter Ava! I mean, no words for that, really. Just Absolutely incredible. It's an RBI single for Hunter Abba. 
Welcome back to BYU Sports Nation. We are live in Studio B. It is game night for BYU softball. They take on number two Oklahoma as they open up a critical Big 12 series. And to help us preview that matchup, we bring in one of the stars for the Cougars. Hunter Ava is with us on BYU Sports Nation, joining us from Oklahoma. Hunter, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for having me. All right, uh, we need to start with the most prominent thing uh, on the agenda here, and that is Grand Slams for BYU softball, which you have been very heavily involved in. Seven on the season. What in the world is going on when the bases are loaded for BYU softball? Man, I don't even know. I guess it just varies from, like, each player, but I, I honestly would like to give credit to our hitting coach that we got, like, we got this year, Ken. Ken Briggs, he actually, like, instilled a lot of confidence with in the batter box for us as hitters and stuff, like giving us plans and whatnot. I love the swagger that you take when you cross I, I, home plate. I, I, I was just going to say, Hunter, can we take a little bit of that drip, that <laughs> little bit of that swagger that you have and just spread it across all of BYU sports, right? I mean, you're rowing the boat on second base, okay? You're doing a little, I, I don't know what that was at home plate, but you got a little sauce to you, which I love, okay? Where, where does that come from? I don't know. Honestly, that home run celebration, I just started it this year, and it was just like in a moment kind of thing. And <laughs> say, hi, Lana, you're on BYU Sports Nation. <laughs> but um, honestly, that was just like kind of like a spur in the moment kind of celebration for me. But that swagger, though, that confidence that you have, was that always in you? Or was that something that, that, that just developed over time? Um, Most definitely developed over time from high school then on. Um, training with like the coaches I've had and like the the past and stuff, they really like helped a lot. All right, we just watched uh, the Grand Slam you had in dramatic fashion against Houston in that wild 17-15 game. That was absolutely nuts. I was watching when I was in Dallas uh, and enjoying every moment of that. But like when you hit that ball, did you immediately know game's over? Um, I. Honestly, I didn't think it was going over. I thought I hit it hard enough for it to be a line drive to at least score, like, at least tie up the game because we I knew who we had on the bags. Like, I mean, I knew I had Violet. Um, no, not Violet. It was Tristan Turlington at second and Taryn Lennon. So they were pretty, like, fast. So I knew if I were just to hit the gap, like, we were going to tie it and then the person behind me was going to win it for us. Yeah. But when it went over the fence, I honestly was just like, no way. That did not just <laughs> <laughs> Well, and to set the stage properly, for those who don't know, you had just given up two runs to Houston in the top of the ninth. You're already deep into extra innings. Softball games only go to seven typically. You're in the ninth. You're down 15-13. Yeah. And then you clear the bases to win 17-15. So with all that considered, is that your favorite home run of your BYU career? If not, what is your favorite home run? I honestly would say that one is my favorite. It takes the cake for it all. It's I honestly just kind of didn't believe that actually happened to me. I'm just in shock. <laughs> well, yeah, I, 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 I'm sure there's going to be more to come because I, I honestly I love watching your fire. I love watching the the level of confidence that you bring. I'm sure it's infectious to the entire dugout. So uh, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I look forward to watching you all season. Playing last year, being the first year in the Big Twelve, Hunter. Playing last year in the WCC, what's the biggest difference so far that you've noticed? I would say the competitive level is most definitely, like, different. Like, Big 12, you pretty much always have to fight for every pitch. Like, in the WCC, like, not trying to discredit them, but I feel like you're, it's just a dogfight every time we get, like, step field when it's Big 12 and everything like that. I just feel like our competitive our competitiveness – and our drive would just have, have to be in, um, in the Big 12 more so than the WCC. Hunter, you have seen the elite of elite pitching this season between the series with Texas, and that was on the road in Austin, and then you hosted number four Oklahoma State for three and saw super high-level pitchers. So how much of a difference will it be when Oklahoma takes the mound tonight? Is it anything that, that BYU and you have not seen this season? Um, no, because honestly, in the Big 12, OSU, Oklahoma State, they actually lead within the pitching staff for um, the Big 12 conference, which I feel like would help us have more confidence within the box, knowing that we already face the best pitching staff within the Big 12. 
Does that, does that give you – I imagine that gives you guys a certain amount of confidence going into this next game, right? I mean, uh, of the games that you've already played against Texas, beating Oklahoma State, uh, playing these teams, how does it prepare, prepare you and the squad to play for somebody like Oklahoma? It most definitely um, kind of puts a reality check on us knowing how we need to prepare, how we need to mentally – stay ready within the game knowing that like any given chance like any given second within like playing like Oklahoma like one swing can change the whole entire game which pretty much is why it was nice playing like Texas and Oklahoma State because they showed us that one swing can change the game and I feel like now that we have that out of the way it wouldn't be as much of like an effect as if we were to play them first out of everybody else. Hunter Ava is with us on BYU Sports Nation. What type of mentality do you need to have as a high-level softball player when there are so many games and there are natural highs and lows? I mean, you're, you're coming off a tough series in Orlando and then you just lost to Utah Valley, but you got to show up and you got to be ready to play your best softball again against number two Oklahoma. So what goes into that mental process for you as you reset again? You most definitely have to have a short-term memory if you're a softball player, given the situation that we have so many games within the season. I feel like even no matter who you play, you just have to forget like like UCF that weekend's over, UVU that day's over, now it's on to Oklahoma. Like you just have to prepare for the now moments instead of like thinking and rethinking about what could have been done like better and what if we did this and that just, it just ruins your mentality a lot. Like it would just put more negative aspects in your mind more so than positive and focusing on the now moments. Okay, so with, with that being said, Hunter, in 2010, I was in the NFL. I got a chance to go be in the dugout or, sorry, be in the locker room or the clubhouse of the Colorado Rockies prior to playing in a, a game the, the, the following day uh, on Sunday. It was a Saturday day game. What amazed me was just the difference in the manner of preparation of baseball players compared to football players, right? You go into a football locker room, it is like you can hear a pin drop, right? Everybody is just on edge, you're mentally in it, everyone's got their headphones on, there's not a lot of talking, everyone goes through their own process or pregame rituals, whatever, you know, getting taped, you know, getting in the hot tub, etc. Then I go into the Rockies clubhouse, man, and it is like party. It is a party <laughs> right before the first pitch. I mean, some guys are just coming out, to, you know, they're trailing out as the first pitch is being thrown. And I tell the guys, I, I, it was Tulowitzki that I asked, he was a, a shortstop for the Rockies at that time. I'm like, why is this so different? How are you guys getting like ready to play? He's like, dude, we play a hundred and something games. We can't always just be dialed in or else we're going to be exhausted. So with that being said, do you find like, what, what is your pregame routine? And do you find it to have to be like a little bit more relaxed, just given the schedule of the year or, the, or of the season? Uh, yeah, I most definitely would have to agree with that Colorado Rocky guy. Cause I don't know. Uh, Given your personality, given mine, like speaking off of like my own personality, like it's very like easygoing. I, if you get too tense within this game, it will eat you up for sure. So staying loose, staying however you need to be into like to stay in green. It's most definitely the kind of way you want to go within like approaching every softball game or every baseball game. Hey, we hope you're showing off that swagger and rowing the boat a bunch Dude, tonight, row Hunter. That boat, sister. <laughs> Give you some BYU Sports Thank Nation karma for the Oklahoma series. And uh, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll talk to you again soon. Thank you. Thank you guys for having me. You got it. The Queen of Diamonds, Hunter Ava on BYU Sports Nation. They get Oklahoma tonight. All right. Love her. Oh, she's great. Up next, with the Masters beginning today, which four sporting events are on your Mount Rushmore of sporting events? This is BYUSN. BYU Sports Nation is presented by the BYU Store official outfitter of BYU fans everywhere. Welcome back in the spirit of the Masters today. What's four, which four sporting events are on your Mount Rushmore of events? At Chaplin O'Neill on X says, I'm going to Sunday's championship round. Jealous. Others on Rushmore, uh, Rushmore and any opening day at MLB stadiums, the Super Bowl, and the Kentucky Derby. Okay? That's, that'd be sweet. Travis Tini on X says, the World Cup, NHL outdoor games. Really fun. Wimbledon, I love that one. I consider that one. And Olympics volleyball. Wim awesome. Wimbledon would be nice. 
In response, our elite voice of the day presented by PAX. Shout out to the PAX guys. Official IPO today. Names hitting the ticker Let's there go. at Wall Street. Josh, PJ, Mark, congrats, guys. BYU CGRS on Instagram, the Super Bowl, the World Cup, the Final Four, and, of course, BYU versus the Utah. Oh, Utes. BYU Utah. Today's Rise and Shout Out presented by Mountain America, the official credit union of BYU Athletics. It goes to Aaron Livingston for a great BYU volleyball career. Our thanks to today's guests. For Austin, I'm Spencer. Go Cougs!